we've seen a rise in requests around loyalty and rewards aspects of OTT. So I think that's, that's kind of the first step, monetizing the kind of engagement that you're getting with your, your customers. If you're watching more videos, you're earning some points, you're able to redeem those points for something in the real world. Welcome back to the Exceto Playback Podcast, the podcast discussing industry news, trends, and tech advancements in the streaming and OTT industry. I'm your host, Neil Van Zyl. Today, we're going to be continuing our conversation from last time with Nikki Perigini, and this time we'll be focusing in on UX trends over the coming year. Nikki has authored an incredible white paper on UX trends, the link to which will be available in the description of this episode. I strongly recommend you give it a read. It's really interesting. This episode, we'll be diving into some of the concepts Nikki touches on and getting a greater understanding of where design and OTT is headed. Well, without further ado, let's jump right into it. Nikki, you uh, obviously published a white paper on UX trends last year. It covers a broad variety of topics within the industry, and it's relevant not just to your region. It, I, I see a lot of the features being brought up much more in NAM as, or North America as well. I'm not going to cover everything because it is a thorough report, but we'll just cover a couple of things that I thought were interesting and worth sharing. Content discovery, as we talk about, is a major issue coming now with all of the different applications available. But outside of AI, what sort of innovations can content providers look to provide? Over the years, we look at trends and content discovery is just one that will not go away. Um, this kind of trend in improving content discovery finding new and exciting ways to feature content. Um, it's something that just sticks year on year. We're, we're still looking for new ways to do this. And I think it comes off the back of our video service providers have great content. There is absolutely no lack in content across the globe. Um, and more and more services are starting to come out with more content. Um, there's a lot of aggregation services where you have content from lots of different services being um, surfaced in one place. And so this just continues to drive that need for effective content discovery. Um, one tool, as you mentioned, is personalization and recommendations. I think, you know, that's just the start of, of where you can go with content discovery. There's new features that are popping up left, right and center in this space. I think Particularly, you'll notice on a lot of streaming services, being creative with the way that you present content on a homepage or a discovery page is something that really drives engagement from a user perspective. We talk about creating bespoke kind of rail types um, or bespoke components on these pages where, um, you know, you might want to feature one particular TV series or movie that's new to the service. How are you going to do that if you just have rails that all look the same? So that kind of comes back to design, right? Um, if you want to feature just a single series, how can we really design a component on a homepage of a mobile app or a TV app that catches attention? Um, maybe you're featuring episode lists on the homepage as well. Maybe, you know, if you've used Apple TV, you might notice they do this really interesting thing where they use one piece of content across a whole rail. And they have this kind of custom artwork that um, it looks like it's a, a large banner but it's actually just using the same rail component that they use for their mixed rails. So there's a lot of different things happening in the kind of rail and homepage space, which I think is really interesting. Um, something else that I want to mention is particularly around that personalization recommendation space. Um, there's, uh, I hate to say it, but there's a little bit of a growing kind of distrust in the way that recommendations are presented. Um, I think users are starting to uh, feel as though the kind of traditional recommended for you rail is not actually recommended for them. Um, so there's a lot going on in that space where, you know, I, I often have conversations with customers or users that say, oh, the Netflix recommended rail is just what everyone else is watching this week. It's not actually what I want to watch. And so there's this kind of interesting space where, People are starting to just expect that to be there and they're not really diving into it as a way of, of discovering content. And so something that some of our customers are doing to kind of drive this a little further is 
actually looking at social recommendations and looking at direct user generated um, kind of personalization. And so what that means is, you know, you might notice that Netflix is starting to really encourage users to um, rate their content after they've viewed it. So they're looking for direct input from the user in what they liked or disliked rather than just trusting an algorithm. Um, and so this kind of format of rating content, um, selecting kind of genres that you like, selecting content that you've enjoyed, really feeding that recommendations engines with um, direct user generated input is starting to become another trend in this space. And I think that naturally then leads itself also to the social aspect of discovering content. You know, you're so much more likely to watch a show if one of your friends has recommended it to you or you had a conversation at work and your colleague said, oh, I've been watching this great, great series, you should watch it. Um, for so many humans, that's just a natural reaction to say, oh, you know, I get along with this person, I'm probably going to like what they like. And so actually building that social experience into the OTT apps um, is something that we're starting to see pop up as a little bit of a trend. Um, if you imagine the way that Spotify handles this from a music perspective, it's quite similar. You know, you can take learnings from what they've done in terms of a very social experience. You can follow, you know, playlists created by your friends or other people that you just like their taste. You can see, uh, you can create group playlists, for example, um, these kind of combined playlists. You can create radio stations based on a song that you really like. Um, so this kind of social interaction, we can really learn from applications that are using this uh, feature in their own way. So I think that we're going to see this continue to, to pop up in the OTT space. And it's exciting to think about, you know, um, can I have a shared playlist with my partner that tells me uh, movies that, that they think that I'm going to like? You know, this is a really interesting space to start thinking about how can we socialize the, the video experience, particularly through, I think, COVID and, and we've looked at a lot in terms of driving more social engagement, um, the kind of video party space that, that started to boom. Um, and so I think off the back of that, there's a lot of social interactions that we can build and we have the infrastructure to do it. You know, we, as OTT services, um, we, a lot of our OTT services now support profiles as standard. Um, you are creating your kind of user account when you log in, um, you have a profile. So the next natural step is to start connecting those profiles together from a social aspect. I really like uh, what you said there about looking to other media vertical services and learning from them. The, the point about Spotify is a great one. All the social features or even just you can see what your friend is listening to. That sort of thing is very interesting to kind of bring over to uh, video. Fascinating. Exactly right. So, uh, one of the other uh, one other thing that can kind of uh, drive a bit more engagement and uh, discovery is obviously uh, this integration more of interactive video. It also kind of goes back into that social watching or that co-viewing experience, but just the idea of uh, bringing overlays or reaction mechanisms that users can play with is is an interesting idea, but obviously not uh, super easy to implement. So, how do design teams need to work with engineering to support features like that? Um, so in this region, uh, in APAC, we have been really lucky to have a local solutions team actually work on this feature. So locally, we've been uh, starting to design and build a feature which allows dynamic video overlays to be displayed on top of live or VOD content. Um, and it comes as no, no easy feat. I think um, the complexity of this feature is not something to just brush over. Um, we have worked for a number of weeks and months um, with, together with development teams, with our solution team and with local designers to kind of understand what are the limitations here. Um, it's a lot of it comes down to uh, latency. So we talk about this kind of low latency experience um, needed for live TV. What that means is that the gap between the real kind of live thing happening and when we see it on, on screen is as small as possible. And so this kind of overlay, dynamic overlay feature, we initially thought, wow, wouldn't that be so awesome if we could match it to live, um, live content and live events? 
And so thinking about like a game show, for example, um, when, you know, you're watching a, a TV game show and you can actually enter the answer on your TV um, or on your mobile device if you're streaming it on mobile. Initially, we kind of thought, wow, that's so awesome. Like imagine that experience. We could really gamify TV watching. Um, it could be this really cool experience. And I think what we discovered is that the latency aspect of this feature is just uh, extremely hard to guarantee. And so you have so many different platforms, you have so many different types of technology that we're trying to support with this. Um, and that kind of concept of it being totally matched to live is just not something that we're there yet. Um, I don't think it's far away, to be honest, you know, where with all the kind of live streaming, especially in the sports space, there's going to be growth in the latency aspects of this. Um, but for now, we kind of pivoted what we were doing with this overlay, um, dynamic overlay experience. And we decided that, hey, if we actually kind of map it to more um, of a social interaction and like a community kind of driven interaction, where it's actually more related to people that are watching it at a similar time to you on the same platform. And so things like, you know, social opinions, um, answering little questions that then drives a uh, poll that's appeared to you, the results later, driving that kind of, again, that social interaction um, experience. I think that's where we kind of pivoted to with it. And there's also a lot of, um, I think, opportunity in this space, particularly in education and in children's content as well. Things where we're mostly watching it as, as VOD. We're not necessarily relying on that live stream. And so when we're watching it as a VOD asset, it's super easy to map these kind of interaction points. So you can imagine um, in a, you know, episode of Bluey, um, we want to know what colour the Bluey's backpack was. And so you can pop up a little interactive question on the screen and as the kids are kind of watching, they can answer those questions and see if they got it right. Um, that's that kind of old school, traditional broadcast where you'd have a presenter asking those questions to your kids at home. Um, but now we're kind of in that space where we could make it interactive. We could actually make it an experience and a storytelling experience on screen. Um, so that's kind of the development of those interactive elements. I think the opportunities in this space are, are pretty wide. Um, when we talk about interactive experiences as a whole, I just want to mention one thing around um, creating unique watching experiences. And I think um, that's a really interesting driver for engagement. Um, if you have a watching experience where someone has experienced something unique, if you can imagine the, uh, what I'm kind of referring to here, a example is what Netflix did with um, Bandersnatch, the, the series that they had, or um, with even with Kaleidoscope, they kind of had this interesting format where you could watch it in any order and have a kind of similar experience. So these kinds of interactive, unique um, watching experiences, I think are going to continue to grow. Um, and the, the dynamic overlays and dynamic stitching of content is where this makes it possible. So you can imagine that you could use this feature, dynamic overlays, to select a path of a movie the way that Bandersnatch kind of did. So yeah, the opportunities are pretty far and wide. Um, there are obviously some limitations in terms of technology, but I don't think that should stop us from starting to explore. One, I guess, going back to the kind of VR experiences, um, I have, as I mentioned, been lucky enough to work on the Apple Vision Pro a little bit. Um, I've been in the developer labs at Apple here in Sydney, and we've just been playing with different ways of interacting with content on the VR experience. And I think especially this kind of interactive watch experience, dynamic overlays, interactive advertising, all of those kind of features become super natural in a VR environment. And so it might be hard to imagine now doing some of these things on your TV may not kind of resonate with a lot of customers, but as soon as you put this headset on, it just feels like the opportunities are so much wider to start working with this kind of interaction. I was just loving it. I just, uh, just, keep, just keep it coming, please. That's incredible. Cool. So we'll just touch on one more topic that you've mentioned in your white paper, but just um, one of the things that has seen much greater success in Asia than in other regions, obviously, is super apps. What I'm curious about is we talk about maybe adding these features of interactive video or extra content discovery, but do you see, do you think there's opportunity for other regions like Europe and North America to expand on these apps where they provide all these different multimedia vertical contents in one application? 
It's a really good question. The you're right. The in Asia, this trend has just taken off. Um, I think it's it's an interesting kind of cultural difference between the regions where I think that as you know, being being working in Australia and New Zealand uh, and seeing the difference between Australia and New Zealand, which is much more aligned with the North American market in terms of trends and, and usage, it's super interesting for me to have that juxtaposition with Asia and the way that different kind of trends start to grow, different types of apps start to build um, in, in, in popularity. And I think, you know, it's partly, um, it's partly because of that kind of consumption mindset. Um, a lot of, there are a lot, a lot, a lot of video apps in Asia. Um, a lot of kind of content creators that have very specific niche content are building their own apps. And so this really means that there's such a huge market of content and these kind of super aggregator apps become really popular. And so if you can think about that in a, you know, as a just talking about video content, it makes sense. But then you have content creators that are not only creating video content, they're also creating music, they're creating news, they're creating podcasts. Um, and so naturally those kind of providers are going to want to have the same app experience for all of the content that they're creating. So I think there's a, just this kind of combination of lots of different entertainment media um, and especially in Asia that's just being combined into these huge aggregation experiences. It's a really interesting thing to design for because consuming audio content is not the same as consuming video content. And consuming news content and editorial content, again, is very different to video content. So there's this real um, kind of app experience, which is why we call it a super app, because there are so many different interactions within these super apps. It's interesting, right? It's a trend that we're, again, even seeing grow to beyond entertainment material. Um, some of these applications are even starting to integrate with food delivery services. Um, with groceries and e-commerce. And so it starts to become this whole ecosystem where you can be watching a movie and order popcorn and soft drink to your house from the same app experience. Um, you can, you know, order an Uber through this app and, and earn points. And I think this kind of points and loyalty rewards environment and feature functionality is something that's driving this super app um, experience. So that's particularly predominant in the more advertising-based regions of the world. I think we could say a very big generalisation, but you could say that Asia as a region leans more to the ad-funded services as opposed to Australia, New Zealand, North America, um, some parts of Europe, which would lean more to um, some of the more premium uh, subscription services. Whilst that is changing with cost of living, et cetera, as a whole over time, that's kind of been the general trend. And I think that for that reason, you're kind of driving this real consumption behavior where if you consume more, you earn more points, you get some discounts, you're, you know, you're saving money over time. <laughs> that's the kind of mindset. So the, the loyalty and rewards aspect of these super apps is what really drives them to continue to grow and incorporate more and more kind of elements of interaction. Um, it's a really, really interesting space to be in, you know, earning points against a digital wallet, which you can spend um, for vouchers or discounts for groceries or Uber rides. It's this really kind of interesting world where we're starting to blend lots of different kinds of consumption into just one app experience. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the, whether or not this will take off in other regions of the globe, we're kind of yet to see that happen. But I will say that particularly with within the last six months, we've seen a rise in requests around loyalty and rewards aspects of OTT. So I think that's, that's kind of the first step, monetizing the kind of engagement that you're getting with your, your customers. If you're watching more videos, you're earning some points, you're able to redeem those points for something in the real world. Um, that's the kind of experience that we're starting to see pop up more and more. Yeah, definitely seeing it over here as well. There is obviously a much more bigger push, largely in sports for that gamification experience where you're getting uh, either rewards or some sort of benefits towards your account that you can then purchase jerseys or uh, other things, exactly. premium content, you know. 
Exactly right. Um, and likewise in this region, sport is the initial driver of that. It's it's such an interesting thing to think about, right? You can um, watch all this OTT content on your phone, earn some points and redeem it in stadium for a voucher for food and beverage, for example. You know, that kind of experience even um, back the other way. When you purchase tickets online, you can earn points against your OTT service. Maybe you can buy some um, T-Bod content with the points that you've earned. So it's a really interesting kind of growth of the environment of OTT. I think we're getting a lot wider than just what's on our device. I'm looking forward to see what you and the rest of the design team can come up with when it comes to gamification in OTT apps. Well, Nikki, I believe we've come up on time. Thank you so much for the discussion. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great. That's it for this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks again to Nikki for joining us. We really appreciated the conversation. It was great to get into the trends a little bit more. If you'd like to read Nikki's white paper, again, the link will be in the description of this episode. Otherwise, if you have any questions or you'd like to reach out to us, feel free to send me a message on LinkedIn or send us an email at playback.podcast at exceto.tv. One more announcement. For anyone attending NAB, feel free to stop by the booth and come have a conversation. We'll be located at W2166. That's all for this episode. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time.